So I'm going to talk about <coughs> automation and flexibility, two things that very much go hand in hand in the industrial space as well as in a lot of different application spaces. I like to call it a, a romance in mechatronics because it's really thinking about how to make mechanical devices as well as software do what we want them to do in a way that, that makes sense. Um, awesome, I'm Kel Guerin. Uh, I have some degrees, and I'm a co-founder and CTO of a company called Ready Robotics. Uh, we're based out of Baltimore. I'm going to talk about that at the end, because what I really want to talk about is uh, robots. So these are a few of the robots that I've worked on. Um, uh, robots for surgery, space. Uh, this is an underground mining robot. I'm sorry for the low fidelity picture, but it's all, you know, classified and stuff, and then virtual reality for robots. Um, but what all of these sort of have in common is, is they are all a form of automation. They're all a way that we can do a process without or with minimal human intervention. And that's really, if we look at the history of automation, that's really where, where this comes from, is thinking about how to take the human out of the loop as much as we can. Uh, this is uh, Sisybus's water clock. This is, he was a Greek inventor, a mechatronist, apparently is what they called them. Um, this was, uh, this is a, a diagram that a, a, a 17th century architect did of that device because there's no known version of it. But this type of water clock was the way to tell time for about 1800 years before a, a French guy came along and decided that pendulums were a better way to do it. This is another form of automation that we all know. This is the windmill. Um, and really the way that a windmill was utilized was using its motive power, the rotation that you get from the blades and from the wind, to really to crush things, honestly. Uh, that was mostly what uh, windmills were used for. They were used for crushing grain. They were used for milling gunpowder. Um, that was really the main uh, force for a lot, of, a lot of windmill technology. But a windmill, and this is where the flexibility comes in, a windmill has a, a very particular problem, which is it only points in one direction. So when you're thinking about building a windmill, at least at the time, you would think about, here's the, the dominant force of the winds, and I'm going to build the windmill, and this is going to be it, right? But half the year, the wind might be blowing in another direction. Day to day, it might change. So it wasn't a very adaptable to its environment. Eventually, in the 17th century, a blacksmith in England came up with the idea that, well, why don't we take a windmill and make the top spin? We add this little fantail onto the end of it, and then we make the entire turret on the top able to rotate, which means that, you know, it seems like a no-brainer now. But this was a huge innovation because it actually made the windmill a flexible device, right? So now all of a sudden we start to see a trend in automation where we really see flexibility being king. Um, this is a Victorian era, or a depiction of a Victorian era um, textile mill. Um, you'd use windmills or water power to actually power these huge belt systems that would then power the actual machines themselves. And these belt systems were very versatile because they could be used for any type of machine, as long as the machine had a rotational component. Um, this is more uh, into the 19th and 20th century kind of technology. This would have been steam power or early diesel electric. Um, but the same idea is, is that you have these belts, you can attach whatever you want to the belt, and all of a sudden you can automate things. You can do things mechanically without people working on them. Henry Ford took the, the, uh, the idea a step further, but this was a very critical point. Because with the invention of the automated assembly line, something very specific happened. When you look at an automated assembly line, Every single station of that assembly line has a very specific purpose, okay? There's one station for, you know, nowadays welding two pieces of metal together. There's one station for putting on the wheel. Everything became very specific, okay? We moved very rapidly away from generalizable uh, and flexible automation solutions to very specific flexible uh, automation solutions that were then daisy chained together to create an actual assembly line. And that same sort of thing is exactly what we have today. Okay, and that's how we can actually build insanely complex devices at a very low cost. The byproduct of that was is that we've had this huge bifurcation in the industrial space because basically half of the industrial space, and I say half in volume, it's actually not in size. Half of the industrial space looks like this where you have very cheap, very high volume processes. Half the industrial space looks like this where you have no automation at all. There's about 280,000 manufacturers in the United States 98% of them look like this, 98%. No automation whatsoever. This is actually a picture of Black & Decker's factory in Portland, Oregon. They make, uh, they make hydraulic chainsaws there. They're very awesome. Um, but 
they make actually fairly large volumes of things and they don't have hardly any automation at all. Now you can consider the machine automation, but in terms of you know, taking the human out of the loop, there's still a person standing there every single day, right? Putting pieces of metal in and out of that machine. And that's really uh, been a bottleneck in recent years when we start to look at the trends in manufacturing and the trends driving manufacturing. We're looking at a world where made where you buy is becoming a really big thing. It's just like farm to table except for manufacturing, right? Mass customization is also a thing. Uh, Motorola was famous for building one of their new factories in Texas uh, and onshoring a bunch of people specifically so that they could have a service where you order a phone online and you, it can look like whatever you want it to look. The front can look weird, the back can be made out of wood, all sorts of cool things, right? The only way that they could do that was because of advances in automation and specifically advances in the flexibility of automation. S bigger companies are trying to get more flexible so they can have smaller production runs, they can be more agile. Smaller companies want to be able to leverage, this company wants to be able to leverage this technology, but can't because the flexibility isn't there because it was designed for this scale. So the other problem is, is that there's a massive shortfall of labor. There are somewhere around 650,000 unfilled manufacturing jobs right now. That's supposed to balloon to about two and a half million by 2020. And the reason is simple. Our parents didn't tell us to go get a factory job. They told us to go to college, right? And go be a, you know, computer scientist, right? So the aging population manufacturing means that there's a huge shortfall of workers. Factories want to meet the demands of these two trends and so they're trying to be more flexible and then machines are also insanely underutilized because they're based on human labor, right? Hum machine utilization is about 48%, which makes sense. People sleep at night, right? But that's a huge amount of work that isn't being done that's bottlenecking the industry. Now, some companies are moving towards more flexibility. This is notably uh, BMW's plant where now BMW can actually make any car in their entire fleet on the same production line, okay? Which is really cool, right? Daimler does the same thing. Daimler is the largest manufacturer of, uh, we would call them semi-trucks, but in Europe, right? And every single one of those is completely different from the next, right? They're all customized. And, and, but these are really a question about process automation, right? How do I take an entire factory and make the entire thing this big flexible machine? The individual flexibility, the flexibility that this guy needs, or I'm sorry, this guy needs, isn't there, right? He's still stuck there putting pieces of metal into the machine. So that's fundamentally the issue that we're trying to solve at Ready Robotics, is when you try and look at this process, this guy is also at Black & Decker, how do you leverage the type of automation that you get at a plant like this? I don't actually know where this is, I'm sorry. I think it may be Tesla. But how do you leverage this type of automation for this guy so that you can better leverage his human labor, right? He has the domain expertise. We just heard a lot about domain expertise, and you're absolutely right. This guy has been working there for 25 years. He's the best at what he does. He knows all the tricks, but he only has eight hours, and he likes to take breaks and sleep and eat and stuff, right? Really annoying. What you need is to be able to have him do the stuff that is really valuable, that an automation machine, that an automated system or a robot can't do right now, because there's lots of things robots can't do right now. And then have robots do the rest. This is the space of robotic hardware and also the space of industrial tasks right now. It's massive. Five years ago, most of these companies weren't there. So we have the tools. It's not like we aren't inventing new technology that is gonna allow us to solve these problems. There's better sensors out there, there's bin picking systems, there's cameras, there's grippers that can adapt to the size of objects. There's all sorts of cool stuff. But what we need is something that actually ties all of this stuff together. We need standards, we need plug and play architectures, and we need flexible connectivity that can actually bring these two things together so that all of a sudden you can actually put this stuff to work because right now it looks like this. This is one of, uh, one of the robots in our lab. It's a universal robot. They make amazing robots, by the way. But when you buy a robot, you get a robot. It's a robot, it moves around, that's it. It can't grab anything, it can't see anything, it can't do anything useful. This is about 5% of the stuff that goes, ultimately goes into our product to create this. So this is a system we call the TaskMate. 
It's a flexible robotic platform that allows small manufacturers to actually leverage automation for the first time, really. The idea behind it is we start with flexibility, right? We say, look, you don't have to pick a single robot. You don't have to build a bespoke system. You can pick any robot. You can pick any gripper. You can pick any sort of option for integration with machine tools. And oh, by the way, you can move it around because God forbid you actually want to use it for more than one thing, right? The way that we do this is not, is smart, <laughs> but a lot of it is really just recognizing that there are a lot of standards in communication and hardware that are being underutilized right now. This is an example, and I really hope that this plays when I hit the next button. Ah, uh, all right, well, I have to dive in, I am so sorry. Aha, this is Stanley Black & Decker with one of our systems. This is that same machine tending task where the gentleman was standing there for eight hours a day putting little cylindrical pieces of metal on a machine. This robot is doing that task. And this isn't the only task that it does for them. They move it around, uh, even sometimes more than once a day, um, to be able to actually set up this task. The reason that you can do that is because of a couple things. One, we're actually looking at the standards um, and thinking about building a system that is flexible, that you can use different tools. The other, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it, but that's, it's really our core value proposition as a company, is there's some insane software behind this. This task, we rolled this out in a day. In eight hours, from the people who set up this task learning to program the robot to when it was making them money was eight hours. And that's, that's not something that you see, because most of the time you're spending your time and effort building out the system so that it actually does what you want it to do because it's not this flexible thing. You have to build it out and then you built it out for a specific process and only that process and if you want to change it over again, you're going to spend that time and money again. I'm going to have to sneak over here one more time. Sorry. This is another task that we do. Uh, this is at a company called Aztec in Baltimore. Small job shop, um, you know, they have four or five machines, 2,000 square feet, but these parts go in an Airbus A380. They're part of what makes the engines reverse when you land so that you can stop, kind of important. They're made by hand, essentially. There's a guy who takes four blocks of metal, puts them into a CNC lathe, or mill, sorry, closes the door, and then takes it out when they're done, and he stands there all day doing that. With our system, this job is running overnight. And what they do during the day is the really fussy stuff where the guy has to stand there with a pair of calipers and measure every single part that comes out of the machine. These are easy, right? So we've actually let them better leverage their human capital because that guy and all of his domain experience can actually do the stuff that's really hard that we can't automate. And the stuff that's easy, we do it overnight. So, what does this mean? Well, what it means is, is that when we talk about robot taking jobs, they're not. They're allowing companies to actually create jobs because, and, and it's basically the, the rule of thumb if you look at the International Robotics Federation, it's about three robots for every, or I'm sorry, it's about three people's jobs created per robot. And the reason is very simple. When you do part of this run overnight, now, you have you know, basically two more people's worth of labor that you can leverage for new contracts, which allows you to grow. Because these companies, they're turning, up, they're turning away labor. They're turning away work, right? Because he only has so many capacity. When he talks about his second shift, you know, the, the, the time where they work overnight, it's literally the CEO of the company staying there until 4 a.m. doing this, right? So with a robotic system like this that's actually flexible, that can be set up in a day, and be used for a lot of different applications, not just one, you can actually start to bring automation to small manufacturers in a way that makes sense and fits them. And by the way, this also works for large companies too because they're trying to be more agile, right? I visited, uh, I, I almost run out of time, but one of the first companies I visited was General Motors, their transmission factory. I said, you know, I don't think this technology is gonna work for you. You don't change over your jobs enough. He said to me, it costs us $30 million every time we change it over. 
if you could save us 25% because your system is easier to use or it's more flexible or it's more adaptable, that's a lot of money. So anyways, that's the idea. Thank you so much. Very cool, thank you. Uh, a lot of people talk about, what is it, factory 4.0 or industrial 4.0. Well, why are things changing? Why is it a, why are we at a pivotal moment for this whole robotics world to emerge and for startups to be building great things? Well, it's really, so industry 4.0 is, is, you know, basically, the opportunity to leverage data in the industrial space, right? It's, it's exactly what you did an amazing job talking about. It's how do we actually take the data that these factories are creating and turn them into something that lets them improve their process, save money, all of that. The challenge there is that a lot of these companies aren't generating that data. Um, uh, you know, I visited a manufacturer where the way that they collected data is they had this huge 40-year-old 10-ton press they had a stick welded to it, and the stick would hit a mechanical counter every time it, it ran. And then some guy would write that number down on a cardboard box and hope that his boss, the next guy who came to take over the job, would see it. That's the reality in a lot of cases. So the larger manufacturers, they're doing a great job of like, you know, adding sensors to everything and stuff. But for the smaller guys who have, you know, that, that, uh, that application that I showed you with, at Black & Decker, they have like 40 of those mills, and none of them are connected at all. Right, so technology like ours where we're putting a robot next to it starts to solve that problem because we are sort of have a now a way to exfiltrate that data because they're, they're buying the robot, the robot's doing work, the robot's interacting with the machine, you get everything there, right? But that's, that's really what's, what's, in my opinion, holding it back is how to, how to get that data out of factories because it's, it's there to be leveraged and there are great ways to leverage it. It's just a lot of it is siloed. And how does one, um, if you're a small startup, how do you start working with some of those guys? I mean, what, what are the, um, it, it, the, you know, one question that people get a lot about the robotics world is that it feels capital intensive mm -hmm. and you're competing with very large, very well capitalized companies. How do you, as a, as a startup, how do you find your way into those large accounts? So a lot of, um, a lot of it is really getting your foot in the door. And, and a lot of these companies, they understand the need of automation. You go into a small manufacturer, like you said, they're way ahead of the curve. They're way more savvy than you would think, but they also are under the opinion that it can't work for them, right? So, I, I mean, you, we can talk, you know, separately about it because I don't want to go into the details. Ready Robotics, we provide an a interesting pricing model that makes it very easy for a manufacturer, small manufacturer to adopt adoption. But it also makes it very easy for a large manufacturer to get a system, see if it works, and then if it does, they keep it, they buy more, they see the value, they get the data from it, and they, they want to have more of those robots doing more and more things. Is there one question over there? Oh, behind you. Actually, thank you. Hi. Ooh. <laughs> uh, very interesting. Um, just a quick question. I mean, some of these, or some of the reason for non-automation is that uh, as you said, they're not very high volume, but you know, fair, let's say mid volume uh, items, and some of them have uh, fairly low margins. I mean, the capital cost for those things might be high, but because of competition, margins are low. Do you have like a sense of uh, when you offer it, what the payback is for the for those manufacturers? Because or um, how quickly do they? Because you, you know, you suddenly double the shifts, but still, there's very low margins there. Right. So, I mean, it, it really comes down to... Um, I'm sorry for the non-technical question. No, no, that's uh, great. That's great. I also love that microphone. It's so cool. <laughs> um, it, it really comes down to how, uh, overhead in a lot of cases because the, the reason people automate is because it's more cost-effective than labor in general, right? That's, that's the known you know, reason to automate. The problem with the traditional automated solution is you're going to buy the robot and then you're going to spend four to ten times the price of the robot actually setting up the task. There's your margin. Right. So if you have a, a robot where that part is easy and you're coming in on day one and paying back, um, you know, making, you know, having a, a, a system that's more cost effective than labor immediately without any of that overhead, then you're you're making money on day one. Did that answer your question? OK, great.
Um, so back on the pricing model, I'm curious, are you pricing it as a service or are you selling them the, the gear? I'm, we're pricing it as a service. Yeah. That's the idea. Great. Yep. That's okay, it's for actually, it seems most um, startups in robotics do, do that, right? Everybody's trying to do a software service type model. The technology, you know, especially when you talk to a hardened veteran in the automation space, right, they're also a very careful and a cynical person, right? And, and, and which is good because that's how they save money and don't have accidents and that's, that's a good trade in that space. But that also means that they may not really understand how the technology works for them. And so for startups like us, it's really about, you know, how do we, with the lowest risk possible for them, get their foot in the door so they understand the value and then hopefully become larger and larger customers. Great. One word on the on Baltimore. What what is it like from a uh, tech? awesome? Yes, we actually have a, at First Mark. We have a couple of companies in Baltimore. I mean, the startup scene is growing. Yeah. Uh, we're in a uh, an incubator called City Garage. It's down in the area that Kevin Plank, the CEO of Under Armour, is pouring a ton of money into. It's it's really great. So definitely up and coming. Lots of lots of hardware companies. Lots of manufacturing down there. So it's a, it, it's we like being close to our customers, and that's. You know, there's a thousand small manufacturers within a hundred miles of Baltimore. Great. So very cool. Thank Great. you so much. Thank you Very so much. It.